Thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. I'm your host, Michael Ambrosino. You know, as a DJ, I'm used to reading liner notes to find out what makes some bands so special. And years ago, while listening, while listening to great albums by Eddie Palmieri and Brian Lynch, Donald Harrison, Sean Jones, and Ralph Peterson, two musicians kept popping up, pianist Sakai Curtis and his bassist brother, Luquez. Pretty soon I realized that if there's a unique space where creative inspiration thrives, that's where you'll find Sakai and Luquez, putting in the time, mastering so many musical foundations while refining their own contributions to the vision and vitality of how Afro-Latin and Afro-Cuban music continue to influence contemporary jazz. We're gonna have a quick say hi to Zakai Curtis, and then we're gonna have a wonderful set from his Afro-Cuban quartet. Welcome to the program, Zakai. How you doing? So good to have you here tonight. Um, wonderful special set coming up with your quartet. I guess this is a premiere, correct? Yes, sir. Wonderful. And now music from the Zakai Curtis Afro-Cuban Quartet.
Good evening or night, morning, wherever you're watching this from. Might be a different time zone, who knows. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, we appreciate Hostess bringing us out. This is uh, Kai Curtis Afro-Cuban Jazz Quartet. And today we're playing selections from our newly recorded record. It's actually recorded in 2019, but wasn't actually released yet. We're, we're waiting for a few things, but the music's there. And uh, you're some of the first people to hear it. So thank you so much for joining us. That was uh, Woody and You by Dizzy Gillespie. The next tune we're gonna play is an original composition that I've written. Uh, it's called 13 Constellation and um, it's a minor blues. So hopefully you enjoy it.
so that was 13th Constellation. We're going to continue with a composition I already forgot. Oh, that's right. When I Fall in Love is an incredible ballad. And, and we have our own arrangement of it. And, and we've kind of taken it in a different direction. So we're playing the ballad in, in, in the ballad tempo. But the percussion is playing a double time rumba feel underneath. And so um, hope you enjoy When I Fall in Love. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for staying with us, and uh, hopefully you're enjoying the music. That was when I fall in love. Um, the next tune we're going to play is, is a piece entitled Cuban Fantasy. And I, re heard, I remember hearing this um, on my Cheetos record, and it's called Live at the Crescendo. And I ended up transcribing the big band version they do there, again, condensing it to a small group. Uh, we did a few of those on the record where we took some incredible big band music and we um, made arrangements for a quartet. This is one of them. Hopefully you enjoy Machito's arrangement of Cuban fantasy, <laughs> but for our small group.
Thank you very much. I don't know if I have to say thank you. I don't know how this is going to be cut. So I'll just <laughs> I'll take this time to introduce, reintroduce the band to you all again. But I'll reverse the order this time. On the bass, uh, it plays everybody from Eddie Paul Mary to Sean Jones. I uh, was in the group with myself and with Ralph Peterson's Triangular Series. Um, actually, we played with Ralph Peterson since 2005. Uh, he's been a great uh, teacher and mentor to us. Just recently passed uh, a few months back. And um, this has been his bass player uh, since that time. So on bass, we have with us my brother, Lucas Curtis. Um, the Congas, winning all types of competitions and awards all the time. But one of the baddest percussionists you're ever going to see on those instruments. You might know him from playing timbales with uh, the, the great Eddie Palmieri, uh, Camilo Molina. And on the timbales, a man I've looked up to ever since I moved to the city, one of the greatest drummers and the greatest timbale players, definitely for this style, but um, from all things jazz. He has his own great band called La Familia Sextet. Check him out, Willie Martinez. Um, my name is Akai Curtis. Uh, this is our Afro-Cuban jazz quartet where we specialize and zone in on a specific Afro-Cuban style of music, but um, specifically Kubop. But uh, we branch off and do all other types of things. Uh, we just recorded a record and we're playing some of the music from that record. We've actually haven't played with each other maybe once or twice um, in the last year and a half. But um, it's amazing to be able to get with some of these musicians and perform some of this music for you, uh, especially in these times. So thank you all. Thanks, Hostos and, and everybody involved, Felix, everybody involved with bringing us out here to do this. We're very honored, and it's our pleasure to be here with you tonight. Our next tune is <laughs> uh, entitled Rumbambola. This is a tune that... Uh, uh, was written by the great Noto Morales, incredible piano player that, um, you know, was just a fantastic pianist, but he had these these other tunes that I've always, uh, I, like, admired the writing of and, and also the musicianship. And so I, I always wanted to play certain tunes of his, and, and this is one of them, and we've adapted it to our group. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Rumbambola.
That was Rumbambola um, by the great Noto Morales. We're going to move on and play a tune by another great piano player. His name is Hilton Ruiz. Uh, he's been an early mentor of mine um, when I was a kid. I used to have a lot of conversations with him over the phone about music and business, music business. Uh, incredible musician. He wrote a tune called Jazzin. And uh, a number of people have recorded this, but um, I particularly love the recording that he did where he plays a solo piano. So we took that version and we decided to feature the percussion section in this tune. So, jazz and thank you.
We're gonna finish off our set with an original composition. It's a tune that I wrote um, many years back when me and my brother were doing a, a live show for Conga Head, and that was for Little Johnny Rivero, percussionist. And we did this trio. I think it's still up on YouTube. And uh, we then uh, brought it into the studio and added horns and arranged it for a larger band. So we took that arrangement for the larger band, <laughs> condensed it again. So before we go, Antimbale is uh, one of my favorite drummers, percussionists in the world, Willie Martinez, the amazing one and only Camila Molina. You don't know what he looks like now because he has the shades on, but yeah, I go online. He's, he's beautiful. <laughs> they're, they're, they're playing so well. I, I, it's, it's such an honor to, to p perform with these gentlemen. I, I can't tell you that enough. And then um, my partner in crime, the guy that makes the order, the song order for all the sets, Lucas Curtis. My name is Zakai Curtis, the Afro-Cuban Jazz Quartet playing some kubop for you thank you all and hopefully we'll see you again soon title of the tune is let's do it again
ending with a song, Let's Do It Again, which is such an appropriate way to be able to perform again after so many months of bands not being together because of the pandemic. That is Zakai Curtis and his Afro-Cuban quartet. Zakai, thanks again so much for being with us tonight. Thanks so much for having me. I can only imagine uh, the challenges of playing in a band after not being able to practice. You know, did it take a while to get the muscle memory and sort of the telemetry that happens with bands? <laughs> yeah, I almost feel it's uh, it's, it's it'll get there. You know, Love the it, music. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we're used to performing so much, right? You know, at, at one show after another show, and and I think this this was kind of a different way of you know approaching the music. So. And, and the music um, sounds so new and old all at the same time. Right, 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 right. So we got a lot to cover with you. So let's get started. I think your journey as a young musician began in Hartford. And you and I were talking about, you know, New York City is, is seen as being one of the preeminent places for jazz and music development. But all across the country, there are other hotbeds. And Hart, um, Hartford is sort of the winning trifecta. It's got a really rich Latin community. And you talked about um, the rich culture there and the educational foundation. So can you talk about what that was like, especially when you started being a part of the Greater Hartford Academy of the Performing Arts? Yeah, most definitely. It, I feel like um, Hartford had, when we were growing up, Hartford had... Uh, a lot of people there that knew what they were doing with the music, the different, but whether it was jazz, Latin jazz, salsa, and um, it was a good thing that there was a, a lot of funding or a lot more funding than there is now uh, for uh, children's opportunities or young student opportunities. Um, there were, were a few schools that we had uh, been involved in, including the Artist Collective, and, and this is in the Hartford area, uh, the uh, Hartford Conservatory, and... Um, there, there's probably a few more that are slipping my mind, but de definitely the academy when we got into uh, uh, high school. So there was a lot, and in in our bands at our school as well. I went to Windsor High School um, and Windsor Middle School, and there was teachers there that knew what they were doing. Right. So I feel blessed to be in that sort of scenario where we could have ch we could choose, you know what you know what to do. Or we, we in in our situation we did everything. So. And then, you know, talk about influences. We, we have some of them up on the screen. You have um, Horace Silver was in the area. And one of the musicians that played an immediate role in Luquez's career was Andy Gonzalez. It's true that Andy gave Luquez his first bass. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Andy Gonzalez was one of our first mentors. Um, if I saw early the, on the picture, you had uh, Paul Brown, Paul Brown as well. Um, Andy Gonzalez and and Hilton Ruiz too. He would come to Hartford mm. uh, every so often, and that's how I got to know um, both of those musicians. And then for you, I mean, it, I'm I'm not sure how old you were, but you you passed on that that you actually were uh, working with Ed Fast and his conga bop group, and you were doing arrangements for them. What what was the role you played in that band? Well, I, I wasn't doing arrangements for them, um, but. Uh, Ed would do arrangements for our band, so we oh, had okay, like a, a young band that that started in like uh, like the Hartford Conservatory or, or in Artist Collective and in those type of schools. And then when we wanted to continue um, studying Afro Cuban music, Latin jazz, and, and things like that, um, <clears throat> we were looking for, uh, or at least our parents at the time were looking for somebody that could, you know, teach us. And then Ed Fast was in the area. He had he had a great band. He still does. And um, he would actually uh, rehearse us with a lot of his charts and taught us a lot of stuff. Him, him there, there were a few parents. I mean, Fre Freddie Moreno was one. Um, uh, Jorge Fuentes, which is uh, uh, a few of the kids in the band, had parents that played, and so they would also contribute to you know the whole scenario. So it's it was it was it's an amazing opportunity at that point that we didn't really know what was going on, but. We do, and 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 I think the the greatest thing about it is Ed would bring in musicians like Andy Gonzalez. He was the one that brought Andy Gonzalez, yeah. and 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 Jackie McLean would also bring in a lot of musicians into uh, Hartford as well. So, um, but we used to go to everybody's gigs, and watch him play and sit backstage, things like that, while we were really young. So, 
So when your parents said, go to your room and do your homework, it was, you know, get back on the piano and, right. and understand these charts as complicated as they were. <laughs> so from an early age, you were dealing with the concentric circles of classical music, jazz and Latin music. Um, how critical was it to have that kind of foundation for what you've ended up doing in your career? Um, well, for me, um, yeah, it was it was I started off as, as a classical musician and I would say around um, high school is when I really started to uh, focus on, on being a, a jazz player or something of that sort. And the reason why I say that is because music wasn't as serious to me until that point. And um, <clears throat> I feel like for it depends on, you know, what you want as your sound as a young musician. I think you can get where you want to go um you know, in, in any genre, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to start as a classical musician or a jazz musician, um, or, or, or kind of, you don't have to limit yourself either by, by any of those boundaries of terms. But for me, that, that developed, you know, I, I still play classical music. Um, I still, you know, I, I, I study everything I could possibly get my hands on. And, you know, R&B and funk was a big uh, contributing factor to my music. So, you know, everything was, was in there. And, and I hear this from musicians all the time. Music is music is music. You know, genres mean less than the integrity of what you're trying to pursue. And the more influences you have, the better. But, you know, already as two young brothers, you're finding your way through the music and you're beginning to have prolific careers. Then you go to Boston and you both travel to Boston. I don't know if that was a, you know, a brotherly pact that you both had, but you ended up <laughs> at the New England Conservatory of Music studying, which by the way, I don't know, the people know that NEC has had a jazz program since the 60s. Yeah. So it's not just chamber music and classical music. And Lucas ends up at the Berkeley College of Music. So, um, you know, when it comes to how did those studies give some muscularity to your musicality? Uh, I mean, it, it's, I, I couldn't, I couldn't know any other way, really. Um, you know, it's funny about NEC. Um, I, I didn't know people like Bill Saxton and Santi Dibriano. I, I didn't know a lot of these musicians went there and I, I work with them uh, to this day. And, you know, um, being in Boston, the great thing about it is you had musicians from Berkeley that co-mingled with uh, people from New, New England Conservatory. And then we would meet at places like uh, Wally's Jazz Cafe and- uh, Isn't Wally's together. sort of like equidistant between the two places almost? Yeah, 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 right, exactly. And and uh, things like things like that were important. And then, and then you had the, 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 for lack of a better term, Latin jazz community, definitely the Afro-Cuban music uh, community. And like they had, uh, Thimba was very big when I was going mm. to school. Um, in Boston, and I learned a lot from people like um, Mela and and a lot of the Cuban musicians that were there. So I feel like, you know, there's a there was a, a also an awesome opportunity in that time period that I was in Boston. Me and Lucas were both in Boston, but we didn't we, we actually didn't coordinate to go to uh, Boston together. So it was <laughs> it just happened that way. My older brother, I have an older brother that played piano. He ended up going to uh, University of Hartford. Oh, so well. he was at Hart School with Jack McLean and me and Lucas were in Boston. But a lot of the opportunities you made during that time were not just educational. They were forming a band. You were playing with a band called Insight. And that's when you bumped into uh, Richie Barche and Ronaldo de Jesus. And that was your Insight band. Yeah, Insight. We started Insight um, much earlier. Uh, we were, as you can see in the, the picture, <laughs> we're all kind of young there. I think that's around um, uh, 2000. But we've been playing in that band since 97. We went to Cuba oh, okay. in 97 and, and, and nine, sorry, 98. And um, we went again in <clears throat> around that time, 2000. So it, it was a lot of musicians in our area, West Hartford area, Greater Hartford area that uh, were, were into this music. And we all got together. We wrote music together and we did arrangements together. Um, and that, that was before college. And then we went to college and we kept the band oh. together uh, a few editions. And then um, then we, then of course, the large band, it was hard to work with the large band. <laughs> and so you, you condense it to the, the core group of musicians, which ended up being uh, uh, piano, bass, drums and congas. And that was what kind of sparked 
you know, everything that that went from from there. In fact, that was one of the origins for the the band that we have today. So it just started it started in that configuration. It, it's nice so early in your career to have a bunch of like minded musicians. It sort of add credence to something you're going to do way down the road. But while both you and Lakez are studying, you're good enough to be drawn away by people like Donald Harrison. You call them Uncle Donald. So right, you're playing right. in his band. And how did he help you both uh, mature professionally? Uh, I, I couldn't, I, I would be here all night uh, answering that question. But I mean, to make a long story short, that was our mine and my brother's first traveling band um, and, and professional. Uh, I, I've, I've played before Donald Harrison, I was working with a bassist, um, Charles Flores, and he was a bassist for Michelle Camilo. A lot of people know that he was, he was Michelle Camilo's bass player. And he kind of set me, you know, with, with a lot of music to learn and things like that. And Donald Harrison, um, has such a different dynamic being, being a musician that's constantly working, you know, overseas and traveling. He was going to, he was bringing these young kids and they're like 20 years old, 19, 20. I don't think I was 20. I think I was 20 and Lucas was 19 or 18. And I mean, there's, that's a, that's a lot of responsibility yes, and sir. you learn a <clears throat> lot just by being so young and, and sitting back and watching on what to do. And then more importantly, what not to do, not just uh, on the bandstand, but off the bandstand as well. And, and then all the musical styles that someone like Donald Harrison has a command of that all of a sudden you need to prepare for. And you told me he said something to you that was fascinating. He said, no restrictions to your musical aspirations. He also said, don't be jaded. What was that about? <laughs> yeah, that that, that might have been, he, he might have told Lucas that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but I, I can totally see that. He was, he's one of the most amazing musicians when it comes to like um, knowing different styles of music. And he expected you to know the different styles, like uh, whether it was Afro-Cuban jazz and it was it was R&B, New Orleans, traditional music, funk, uh, straight ahead blues. You know, he he would, you know, make sure Brazilian music or samba. Yeah. It was very important that you understood exactly how to play the music correctly. And then you can kind of build from there. But but he knew he knows all that stuff. You know, I know it probably doesn't surprise many people, but he knows everything. He knows the piano part, the bass part, the drum part. And he can show right. you how to do everything, which was a lot of our early development was that, you know, he, he'd say, here, step away from the piano real quick. <laughs> You're not doing it correctly. And and it was it was a great learning opportunity. You know, and I, I, I don't know what I would do without it. And, and you know, the foundation that that built for you and Lucas, all of a sudden you're playing with Brian Lynch and, and Eddie Palmieri, you know, it, you just go from fast to faster and then it's New York City and now you're branching out with a variety of bands. Lucas is playing with Gary Burton. You're playing with Christian Scott. You're you're really saturated in Afro-Latin and Afro-Cuban jazz. And something you said is you kind of trained to play with them. And, you know, listening to you talk about your own personal musical heritage, it now makes sense. You had all the foundations to play with a broader diversity, of, a broader diversity of musicians that existed in New York City. Yeah, I got to give a lot of that credit, if not all the credit to, to Pops, because he's not a musician, but he he would uh, pick out the records. So my dad would have uh, you make these playlists of musicians and, and it would go from, you know, John Coltrane to you know, Tito Puente. So it was no real lines, you know, or James Brown would be in the mix. So we didn't really have any lines with what we were listening to. And so the same thing happened when we would play in our basements. So we would play, you know, it could be James Brown one day, Earth, Wind, a Fire, and the next day it's Mongo Santa Maria. So it's, you know, taking that approach when you're young and, and kind of trying to navigate through all these different, uh, I guess, avenues of music. But yeah, that's we 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 were like, we were blessed. We were blessed, and yeah, I, I see the picture of McCoy Tyner. We, I think um, that that opened up a lot for us too when we got to see uh, McCoy Tyner in Hartford. You know, he brought he, he would bring his band. He brought his Afro Cuban jazz band there. It's like great memories with with that sort of thing. You're you're also learning about the sort of the structures of how popular music and classical forms of music that even include jazz they're all complicated. They all have their kind of intricacies and you're beginning to blend those together. You're also playing with 
uh, Ralph Peterson, and then Bill Saxton, and the bassist Cecil McBee. And, and when I heard about that, it's like Cecil McBee has done so much amazing work. I mean, that must have been challenging. Well, I, I didn't play with Cecil McBee, I, but but I was work. I I studied um, in one of his ensembles or after his ensemble. I would meet with him. I would talk with him, and that was in NEC. So he oh, was okay, a teacher at NEC, and that was my relationship with him. And it, it, it's just a blessing to know people like Bill Saxon. Bill Saxon was my first um, gig in New York City at the Lennox Lounge. And that happened, of course, through my 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 late mentor, um, Ralph Peterson, which just recently passed. Um, so there was um, a lot moving into New York and, you know, to have people like Ralph Peterson and, and Bill Saxon help, you know, pave the way. And then, and then shortly after, Antoine Roney um, and, and Cindy Blackman Santana. So there was a, a lot more people that that I ended up uh you know, you know, uh, working with and, and befriending and really learning so much uh, as a musician. And and then, of course, like you mentioned, Brian Lynch. Brian Lynch uh, was, you know, when I first uh, met him, I think Luke Hezler had already played with Brian Lynch before. And um, then I started working with Brian Lynch. But I, I love to get together with him because every time I got together, it was a lesson. So even if I was just rehearsing his music, um, you know, on a random day, I was like, hey, Brian, are you doing anything? Love to run through you know, a few of your charts from this record, he's, he'd say, come on, come on down. And I was getting lessons, learning his chord changes and things like that. So it's, it, it was really for me, an educational hustle when I, when I moved to New York and, I, you know, I, I can't say enough about those people. And, and when you're in New York, it's hard not to be influenced by all the bands that are actually functioning in that community, including, you know, Papo Vasquez, the Fort Apache band with Andy and Jerry Gonzalez and Milton Cardona. And, you know, were you yeah. also taking the opportunity to go to clubs and take in these new bands and maybe yeah. sit in? I used to go to the New York and Poets Cafe um, quite often. And I would see um, Will Willie Martinez down there. His oh. band was playing Chembo Cornell's band and um, or Hector Martin Young's band and Ray Vega's band. And Ray Vega, when he ended up uh, moving to uh is it New Hampshire, Vermont? He ended up moving to Vermont. He gave us his night at the New Eureka uh, Poets Cafe, which was, you know, such an amazing, amazing opportunity. Um, the, that that club is, has has such a legacy, and um, but but the Fort Apache band, um, which which we ended up playing with the the last configuration of their band, um, was, um, you know, that they were on such a. a a high level for us as young students and and fans of the music. I mean, there wasn't a band cooler. It was like <laughs> Miles Davis band and Fort Apache band, <laughs> and so we would go see them play no matter what, wherever they were. Right. And and I think um, that relationship ended up, you know, we, we ended up really knowing their music and transcribing their charts. I would actually Joe Ford would send us some of his charts to play. Mm -hmm. You know, like a lot of music, we, 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 if, we, if we couldn't get them, we would transcribe them. But for, uh, Fort Apache was an amazing experience just to be uh, around those musicians and, and kind of learn because they, they really brought uh, Afro-Cuban jazz to a different sound. And well, Remember that wonderful album, Rumba Para Monk? I mean, the first time I heard that, I was completely blown away. And again, it's an avenue once you listen to music like that to, to go back in time and listen to the musical heritage that created that moment, but also to be like, whoa, you know, what are, what are other cats doing that's as electric as that? So I'm curious, you just mentioned about seven or eight musical genres up into this particular point in your career. Were you beginning to hear any common threads that connected all these musics together for you? Um, I, I think quality, you know, for me, it's quality. I love tunes. I'm, I'm a composer at heart, like an amateur composer, really. I do it whether I'm getting paid or not. And um, I feel like there's a, an element to, um, to the quality. So I might pick, it doesn't matter um, the genre really for me. You know, speaking of genres, we, we have a question from our listening audience. This person asks, which style is more gratifying to perform and record, jazz or Latin? <laughs> right. You're going to piss someone off right now. No, well, it depends on who with. Right. I mean, right. I, I don't I don't really see it that way. And, and I switch uh, uh, like I'll, I'll go from playing uh, a performance with Cindy Blackman Santana to literally the next day doing something with the Mambo Legends 
and then the day after that playing with Donald Harrison. And it's it it is an interesting thing. Sometimes it does take a second to adjust, but I feel that there's there's not really um uh I, I don't really think about it that way. You know, I don't think about it that way. It's I'm really focused on the musicians that I'm currently making music with and the music that I'm making music with. I, I don't really think about it in that, that sort of I mean, just as an example of, of two different, you know, you know, you have Pedrito Martinez, who you might have been influenced by or played with during that particular time. And then you have Sean Jones that Luquez was playing with. So, again, all these musical influences. But I'm really curious about when you when you I'm not sure if you bumped into them, you might have known them for a long time. But the work of Los Planeros de la Veinte Uno. Yeah. And you mentioned um, in one of our conversations that you found them to be innovative. And I was wondering if you could impact that because their music is really rich in that particular. Yeah, realm. I, I it, not just innovative. I think a lot of people um, really commend um, that organization, that band, um, Juango and what he's done. I, I, I feel like um, what, at least me playing with them has been uh, such a blessing because I learned a great deal, learned a great deal about uh, the culture. And that's how, I don't speak Spanish, so my uh i guess my understanding to what's going on is is quite limited but <laughs> musically i it really got me uh taking a different different approach into you know that that side of music and, and kind of understanding it from the inside out and and you really don't know it until you actually uh you know work with musicians like that you really can't do it any other way um the question by the way about whether you appreciate uh playing and recording jazz and Latin music is from a fellow musician named Steven Aquino. <laughs> Who's that? No, he's a good friend of mine. He's an incredible uh, uh, um, trumpet player that that has his own big man, um, uh, Steven Okendo Latin Jazz Orchestra. They, they, they would play in the Bronx at, at Mama, Mama, I think it's called Mama Juana's at a restaurant. And, and I would go see their band play quite often. And sometimes you let me sit in, <laughs> but um, even I'm I'm sorry I mispronounced your name there. I I, I saw it, it as an O, not an A. <clears throat> oh, that, that that's a, that's all right. Um, he asked which style is more gratifying to perform. Is that that the is that the question? Right, I, that was the question you answered. <laughs> like I said, it's the quality of the musicians. Right, right. I mean, you know that that really is the the answer for me um, because I don't have one. I, I really don't see it like that. So another amazing thing that you did um, that more people are doing now, especially in the pandemic, is you said a particular part of your career, you weren't quite ready to join a label. So kind of, you know, as necessity is the mother of invention, you created one, you created Truth Revolution Records. So are there, what are the clear advantages of owning and operating your own label in that regard? Advantages, um, well, it's a lot of work. <laughs> It's a lot of work, um, and I, I feel like um, there's hmm, how, how do I explain it? Uh, it? It came about as a necessity. Luckily, I was with a lot of like-minded musicians, and I, I wanted to create an environment where we could build an audience, um, build a lot of people that were, you know, wanting to hear. I don't know. Well, at first it was just my own records. I didn't I didn't want to release a lot of other people's records. It was just for me. And the reason for it was um, I was being mentored by Hilton Ruiz at the time. And people that know him know that he was very big on owning your own music. He, he wanted me to he, he actually helped me get my first LLC or company, publishing company, things like that. And um, with that, I got uh, Truth Revolution Publishing. And that was my own thing. And then over time, I started releasing my own records um, and our circle of musicians started to release as well. And that's where it transferred from, you know, the, the name transferred into uh, a, a, a record label, which then um, recently, I would say this is our first, uh, 2020 was the first year that we have officially transferred over to uh, a recording collective, which is Truth Revolution Recording Co Collective. And so all of the musicians come together and they release their own albums. This is well, how we've been doing it, we just released together. And, and, and I would I would really encourage the audience 
uh, if it's possible to go back to the previous slide just quickly, just to look at that uh, URL, because this is a fantastic collection of artists. And I'd like to say that you've always played with eccentric, unique, but quality musicians. And if we can go forward to the next slide, you'll see that the collective is made up of the same representation of talent. It's all across the board. If you wish to listen to a broad spectrum of jazz, all you have to do is to go to Truth Revolution, check out their collective, and see what they have to uh, to offer. And of course, buy the music. Always a good time to do that. Um, by the way, uh, the Grammys just put out this story that I found that said that your collective is one of the best labels of 2021, or definitely a label to check out. So it's one of the best small record labels in jazz. So that's good news for you. Um, by the time that you are um, producing, which is, so in 2017, you produced an album by um, Andy Gonzalez that got a Grammy nomination. How long had you been producing up to that date? Um, I've been producing music well, well, the, the Grammy.com is just amazing for, for uh, listing us with all those incredible labels. I think they had Motema in there and, and Biophilia, a lot of record labels that I follow and, and love. So, um, you know, we're super honored to even be a part of that. And and I feel like, um, oh, well, well, my production side of things um, start really early. Um, I was producing music definitely right in the beginning with the college era i started recording and then i was always into recording in terms of having some sort of pro tools and, and microphones and things like that so i, I was always recording and, and editing I, I didn't really mix music but i edited and i recorded um, i did video as well and so i, I would produce recordings me and lucas would produce recordings in some sort of capacity and we also had friends that were really into that um, at the same time. So I started early, I think. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't until I got to New York and met some people that are really good at it where I, I was able to learn um, quite a bit, so. And um, at a particular, you're very much in demand, both you and your brother, you're still in New York City for a while. And a lot of musicians say this, that after a while, when they begin to develop a reputation, they're being picked up, as side men or women for various bands, especially if they're good, they decide that they want to choose quality over quantity. So, what did that look like for you? Wait, I, um, I don't understand the first part. Say that one more time. <laughs> um, when when you sorry. and I had a, a, a previous conversation, you were talking about at some point in time, um, you you wanted to basically make sure that the bands you were playing with. Um, we had a certain quality, but also that potentially you could start making more money that you decided that instead of doing many gigs for a small amount of money, you wanted to somehow change your entrepreneurial energy or agency so that you could make more money on gigs because you were beginning to have families oh. and New York City is expensive, that pretty much. Yeah, it's like a natural progression, I think, for all musicians. Um, yeah, I, well, you know, you know, it's hard, you know, when you're young and you go into New York and you don't have a family, you don't have uh, a lot of bills, or you do, you just don't pay them. <laughs> then you um, you can kind of spend money on your own projects. You can go ahead and spend, you know, uh, you know, five, six thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars on your project um, without asking anybody. I mean, you're the only one that has to worry about the repercussions of that. Um, as you get older, it changes. And so I, I was just, I, I, I think in that scenario, I was just trying to um, describe that transition that me, all musicians have. At some point, you end up having um, different responsibilities. And then that, that changes. Now you can't be an amateur with music, which is kind of the, I feel like the best way to be. And you have to actually really think about your, your options um, to get rent paid and you know bills paid <laughs> family taken care of things of that nature and and that that was a transition that of course me and my i had to make with my family and my brother had to make so you know a, a lot of things change and, and to be honest um that's kind of what everybody goes through but but that that's the first time we went through that was changing insight from a seven eight piece band into a quartet so right yeah 
another cool thing you did was um, software development. I mean, oh, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> s- some musicians have done that and you create apps that basically have to deal with either teaching music or auto-tuning your instrument. Or in the case of Christian Scott, it's my brand is now a platform um, that is online. So that's pretty cool. Um, now we're going to bump into someone who's been in, in, increasingly important as you are moving through your career. And that's the drummer, Ralph Peterson. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, you know, so many musicians have done is to trust you to carry the torch of their music. So, and that's kind of unique is when musicians essentially say, I value your contribution enough that I want you to play a bigger role in the band. So what was that like with Ralph? Um, Ralph was a very close mentor of mine, uh, you know, since 2005, I've been working with Ralph. We, we, our first gig, our, our first real gig was at the MFA trio with my brother and we, we developed the band at Cecil's club, uh, in New York when we came, when we came, when I came to New York. And then from there, we ended up having the trio. We, we, we perform quite a bit and then eventually recording Triangular 3 many years later. But before then, we were playing with different configurations of his band. Um, Ralph Ralph was an incredible musician and an incredible person. Um, I love talking with him. And um, he, he really had, you know, uh, uh, he was one of the biggest people in my corner, you know, so to speak. Um, so so he will he's dearly missed. But his music lives on. We just um, recorded a record. Um, right before he passed, the month before he passed, and um, it was released a couple of days ago. Raise, raise up off me, yeah, raise it just up came off out. Me. Right, and that that can kind of show like R- Ralph was a very spontaneous type of person. Like you know, usually first takes, um, very <laughs> very little um, corrections were allowed in his recording sessions. So um, re- you you really get this raw snapshot of what we've been working on for quite some time, but. You know, throughout the years, um, we we've really gotten to know Ralph um, in a um, in an intimate way, very personal um, uh, personal per, per, personal context rather than just musical, and uh, yeah, I think um, I mean there's a lot to say about Ralph <laughs> at this point, but um, I, I could just leave it there. Well, let, let's let's end with Cuba. What you're doing now, kind of the culmination of a lot of what you've done in your career. And I was curious, what role have the, um, I'm not going to, I'm going to mispronounce this, Syzygy, correct? Yeah. Syzygy and Insight, you know, w- did they play any role in Kubop or is it mostly pushing against that and going back with, to the tradition and trying to make it new again? Well, well, Insight was a very experimental uh, form of, of like, like like dealing with Afro-Cuban jazz, Latin jazz at that point. It was more Latin jazz. We did everything, South American music. Um, we, we did music from, so Latin jazz, like an umbrella term and then, and then Afro-Cuban jazz, a little more specific. And so, um, um, we then, when we made the quartet, we kind of focused a lot more on Afro-Cuban jazz and R and B. And that was, that was a big point for us. Um, and then at one point we're like Syzygy, the la- that, that record before the last is, um, a record where it, uh, has mostly covers and there's a lot of R&B on there. And so our main things, normally we do a lot of originals. I would write music, Lucas writes music, we'd write music together. Richie would bring stuff, Ray would write music. And so Syzygy was a different, different animal um, to try to capture. And we recorded that in our basement. Um, so after we did that record, I looked at Lucas and I was like, man, you know, out of you know, out of all through the years, we usually cover some sort of, of of kubop tune like bouncing with bud or hallucinations. Right. Those are very old arrangements that we developed. Uh, I don't know in like two thousand. So then um, we were talking about uh, doing something where we just focus on kubop, and that's the birth of of this recording. And and I the uh, the reason why I have a tr- uh, more of a traditional um, band with timbales instead of drums. It's because um, uh, I was I was trying to model it after Noro Morales, his sound, and he's such an incredible pianist. And so I kind of took 
uh, that sound and, and developed it with all the rest of the rest of the uh, Kubop tunes. And I would take tunes like Kenny Dorms from Kenny Dorms records, from Machito's records, where it's like more of a big band sound, and then condense it. And also Dizzy Gillespie, of course, condense it. So like it. Dizzy Gillespie, yeah. uh, Mario Bauza, Kenny Dorm, and lesser known figures. You know, yeah. all of these are playing um, a role into who the Kubop legends are. And, and then, you know, this is when you're taking big band arrangements and adapting them to your smaller group, which is, is a remarkable right. challenge. But then there's also the contemporary influences as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yep. The, but the, we still um, have, we, yeah. yeah. I just want to say, <laughs> let, let, I mean, like we've talked about those. So let's uh, let's talk about Nora Morales. What what was it about this specific musician and what he was trying to accomplish that was so influential with your the music you're trying to play right now? Um, Noro is, you know, I, I've always known Noro and, and, and played his music, his original music, uh, Mario Cervantes. We've recorded that before. And, you know, I've always known him as, as some of the music some of the music that is a little more classical sounding um, to my ears. But that was some of the those written charts written in a more of a classical type of way. And um, I was going through his music a while ago and I ran into some some of his tunes that are more, I would say, in the in the style of Kubop. Mm -hmm. And they they were incredible, like they just uh, he played incredible on it. The musicians are incredible. And I, I kind of like had this idea is let, let's do a, a tribute to him. And so we picked, you know, uh, three or four tunes and we did a small group arrangement, very similar to how he did it um, with our band. And, and I actually try to to reach that that type of energy that he's able to reach on a piano. If you tell he's very percussive at points and he, he does these things from the bottom of the piano, the top, and it's, it's almost like this drumming that ends up happening. And so, so I, 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 I um, I've been practicing that and, and listening to his sound for years. And, and at that point, I said, OK, I, I feel like I want to try to to capture some of that and pay tribute to him. And so we did that for the record that we recorded. And, and what's so fun is when you listen to your music, like I said at the top of our interview, it sounds both new and old. And just like, you know, 30 years ago when I listened to Weather Report and it made me want to know who Wayne Shorter was, now I want to know who Nora Morales is because it's the foundation of the music you're trying to do now. We have a question uh, from our listening audience. Marilyn Diaz says, where does the name Syzygy come from? Um, that was, you know, Syzygy is the name of the only original tune on the record. And that's why I decided to name the record Syzygy just because it was the only real original tune. But the, the word, it, it means like the relationship between the sun, the moon and the earth. It's like three or four celestial bodies, the, their relationship. And that's that's the word they use to describe it. Um, and so I, I, I named it that, uh, named the, re, the tune that, because I name a lot of my music based on what I'm reading at the time. So that was something that I was reading. But it kind of does work. Like if you think of like a trio or a quartet, you know, if you, if you kind of compare the syzygy of stars and constellations with, with a band, I don't know. Just a nice light title, you know, no right. deep meaning at all. Right. It, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I wish I was that deep to say, oh, I'm going to make an album with it. But no, nah, it was just the name of the tune. People say jazz is too deep. I don't know why. Why? So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, you were um, you talked earlier about how you you're loving the fact that you're making room to explore Kubop, that you used to do it piecemeal over the course of your career. And now you want to focus on it. And you shared something with me earlier where you said, this is the music we love. This is the music that feels like home. What is it about the music that makes you say that? Um, I, well, I mean, when we play it, um, and, and for me is with those, with those musicians, um, but when we play it, it kind of brings us back, me and my brother, both bring, brings us back to that point of uh, of when we're in the basement, right? And and everybody's jamming, and you, <laughs> you know it's not we, we kind of know what we're going for, you know, Allegra All Stars with Charlie Palmieri on piano, and, right. and that that sort of vibe is what, what we you know we love that we still love it, and um, Fania and things like that. So you you're not really. Um, it's kind of the, the you know the, the walls are kind of broken down in those sessions in in mm -hmm. those sessions you know the, it's not so boxed up with with arrangements sometimes you could just break down the walls and and play for 
you know, a good 10 minutes on a tune, <laughs> have a couple percussion solos and you get to jam out and really, and, and also you get to, to connect with the music like like in a danceable sense where you, you, right. you I'm not dancing on the piano and we're not dancing but there's something that kind of hits you when the music ha still has that element to it and I feel like um with this band we can get there you know sometimes it, that that's a beautiful statement because um any group that has ever made an influence in Afro Cuban or Afro Latin jazz when I think of Ray Barreto's sextets uh Ray Vega to some extent Eddie Palmieri it has all of those characteristics it's advanced music, it deals with folkloric traditions, it's got a rich connection to salsa and dance, and yet it's jazz, it's uniquely jazz. Yeah. And so I, I sense you're doing the same thing. And I love how Willie handles um, the percussion role of being a drummer, but a timbales player. It, if you listen carefully, it's very unique. By the way, before I forget, is there a release date for the new record? No, 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 probably 2022 though. Oh Lord! So so you played <laughs> us this music, and now we we can't have it in our hands until 2022. I mean, it, it was supposed to already be out, but you know things have changed so much, and we're working on like six records for this year. And um, I mean, it, we, we, we you know that's that's the sort of the what ends up happening, but it, it'll be out, and you're, you're going to hear it. we're we're going to be playing throughout the summer, and you know hopefully throughout the rest of the year. So. Well, I mean, as soon as you can, as soon as you can send it my way, I'll put it on my programming for sure. Will do. Um, well, another question from Radames Ortiz. Um, how would you describe the creative energy between you and Luquez, considering your brothers? Um, <laughs> it's there. It's there. Uh, I, I think. Cain and Abel. Know, well, I mean, yeah, it's it's Cain and Abel and Brotherly Love all at once. I mean, I mean, every every brothers band or band with brothers in it can can talk about that. Um, it's a lot of fun. I think the great thing about it is not necessarily having to um, tell a bass player what you want. For me, right. you play that. So it's one less musician to worry about, you know, kind of, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> I, he, he just goes, and I can't say anything. I mean, you can't. So you just you right. kind of go with it. And, and that's, that's the vibe. It, it, you still never know what's going to happen, you know, even well, though you've been playing forever. You still never know. Luquez, I'm sure Luquez keeps you on your toes and vice versa. Right, right. Um, <laughs> one of the things that, that uh, I love about your music is it, you're paying it forward. You're taking the rich traditions of music that you've absorbed and you're trying to reinvent it for a new audience and a, and a new cadre of musicians. And you're also doing that as a writer. You're coming out with a book soon, edited by John Santos, the maestro himself, the famous yeah. percussionist, activist, professor, uh, pretty much does everything extraordinarily well. And it's called The Art of Guajal. And you said you want this to be a tool for students to understand Afro-Cuban jazz. That's so exciting. Right. Yeah, that, that was a, um, an idea that I had um, when I started thinking about instruction. You know, and I, I didn't want to do a how-to book. There's a lot of great how-to books. Um, and and I, I mean, there's a lot of great Montuno books. And I didn't want to go in that direction. So instead, I already had a bunch of Montunos or Guajeos transcribed. And I, I wanted to go through this, use it as kind of like a reference guide. And so hopefully it'll be out um, by the end of the summer and available. And and the, it, John Santos is just absolutely amazing to, to work with me on this. And um, a lot of people have contributed. Um, so it's not just me. And, and all the information on there is inf information that I've actually talked to people about. So um, nothing's really copy and pasted from anywhere. It's just uh, call people. What do you think about this? And what is that? And what is this to you? And how do you feel about that? So this is and, and, and the historical is, is some historical information in there that um, has to be accurate in order to really understand the, the music. The music has to be uh, connected with the culture. So one of the biggest parts of the book is telling young students to go and see these concerts, meet the musicians, go see John Santos play, go meet him, get his phone number, 
go over his house. <laughs> I mean, with his permission. But I mean, you, you want you realize to realize <laughs> there's going to be a line outside of John's door. Hey. You're going to get a call from John like, what did you do? What did you just say? It but is the you, only way to do it. It's the only you know, way to do it. One of the big uh, one of the big conflicts right now when we look at jazz education or education of music is that in some ways it's entirely academic. So I love, again, the refrain that says jazz, Latin jazz, Afro-Cuban jazz, jazz that's influenced by Caribbean influences. It is an oral tradition. It is a cultural tradition. It is part of a larger community. It's not just educational, although, you know, conversely, a lot of the musicians that make up this history actually did go to school, actually did teach. And so, but it has to be a handshake. It has to be uh, both and not just one or the other. And this That's is right. what's so hard about the pandemic because all the bandstands where all this learning takes place are gone. Right. Finally, they're coming back and, and musicians are thrilled. Um, I wanna make sure that we show all these other Curtis Brother albums that people can pick up if they're interested in this wonderful duo. Um, and also uh, one last slide just to show the Truth Revolution records again. So you can go to the website. They have merch. They got T-shirts, <laughs> hoodies, I think. Right, you right, know? right. There's a hoodie. And there's um, a blog. So it, again, the collective is, is one of the things I like about this. It's not just a label. It's a collective. And the collective gets to have their own opinions by having artist blogs, which is lovely. And you're sponsored by Bandcamp. And if you don't know, Bandcamp gives the vast majority of funds from all CDs back to the musicians. So that's a great storefront. Yeah, they're great. So, um, Great to see and hear from so many people who joined us today. Well, let's fit in a question before we go. Um, Gwen, 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 I'm not sure why it says Gwen, Gwen, about uh, the 22 album. Uh, or will you polish it to perfection? Uh, I think the question is, are you going to release it early in 2022 or it might be longer because of the production routine? Um probably early in 2022 um yeah, well yeah I, I probably after the holiday i would say um is probably is is more or less but i'll keep it the name of the record is going to be kubop lives and and it's it's volume one and volume two and probably they're going to be released together <laughs> so I might have to re rework that but it's kubop lives and and you soon will have a single available i got to get it mixed and then once once you either download the single or subscribe to our, our channel then you're going to get news on the rest of the record and we have to remind everyone that that zakai is also a father and so oftentimes <laughs> he is busy with that as well as the child that is truth revolution uh music so um you have a lot on your plate right now most definitely yeah um Great to see and hear from everyone. Thank you very much for your contributions today. Thanks for all your questions and comments. Uh, thanks again to the entire production staff at Hostos Center for the Arts and Culture. And of course, a very special thank you to Zakai and Lucas Curtis. Uh, I'm Michael Ambrosino, host of the jazz program Currents and the jazz audio documentary series called Dialogues. You can hear them both at my platform, 33third.org. Make sure you stay tuned to the Hostos Center for the Arts and Culture as the spring series continues to unfold with many wonderful events. And for more information, you can visit hostocenter.org. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.